All right, so uh, we're continuing in on our series on identity wars. Uh, we've been talking about the war on identity and why it's important more than ever before for us to get a handle on what true identity, biblical identity, entails. Identity is what answers the who am I. It answers the who am I question to your life. Who am I to do this? Who am I to be this? Purpose is about doing. Identity is about being. And we live in a culture that really uh, pushes find your purpose, find your purpose, find your purpose. But if you don't know who you are, you will never complete your purpose because you will be defined, unfortunately, and this is why I'm calling it identity wars, our culture puts a war on identity and tries to get you to grapple with this question of who am I on the basis of how you feel on the basis of how you feel. And if I'm going to follow my feelings on how I feel on who I am, I'm going to be a wreck. I'm going to be yanked all around because isn't that what emotions do? They yank you all around. If I'm listening to my emotions to define who I am, I'm going to mostly feel like a defeated failure. Can I be honest? I'm going to mostly feel like a defeated failure. And if I'm using the I am statements to define who I am based upon how I feel, I'm mostly going to feel tired. I'm mostly going to feel lazy. I'm mostly going to feel unworthy. I'm mostly going to feel inferior. I'm mostly going to feel defeated. I'm mostly going to feel ugly. I'm mostly going to feel fat. I'm mostly going to feel bald. But God doesn't define me on my baldness. <laughs> and he doesn't define me on my laziness. We have to listen to what God and his word defines us to be. And so my job as a pastor with every other pastor in this region, our job Sunday after Sunday morning is, can we just believe the Bible? Can we just believe what God declares us to be? And so on the screen, we've been talking about it for a number of weeks. Here's a number of different statements that we've talked about. This is how God defines you to be. And by the way, there's a lot more. And so if Christians can just get this into their mind, instead of feeling, I'm a loser, I'm dumb, I'm not smart enough, no, 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 I'm lavished with love, I'm wonderfully made in his image, I'm a child of God, I'm chosen, I'm called, I'm forgiven, I'm cleansed, I'm the righteousness of God, I'm holy and blameless, set free, dead to sin, doer of God's word, a disciple of Jesus, God's workmanship, it goes on and on and on and on. Now last week, as this is still up here, the last two weeks, we've talked about the life of Rahab, and we used her life as an illustration on identity. And with, uh, with Rahab, we learned that she is adopted into the family of God. And so we've learned about what it means to be a child of God, that we are children of God, and we've been adopted according to his good pleasure and his will. The following week, we talked about Paul. Paul was a murderer, he felt like a murderer. He felt super unworthy to be called one of the greatest apostles that ever lived. And so we talked about Paul. Paul is the one who says, hey, I'm forgiven, I'm called, I'm chosen, I am justified. So we talked about the life of Paul. Last week, we talked about the life of Joshua. And how many of you guys enjoyed last week's message? Everybody say, I am more than a conqueror. That's who you are. And so we've used the life of Joshua and depicted the book of uh, Philippians and Romans in saying that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So we talked about I'm more than a conqueror last week. We talked about I'm lavished with love. And we talked about I am able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is who I am. This is how God defines me. This week, I want to go ahead and talk about the ones on the bottom, the circle on the bottom. I want to go ahead and talk about I'm a new creation. I want to talk about minister of reconciliation. I'm ambassador of God. I am the righteousness of God. And so this week I want to address those components. And so I want to go ahead and for us to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's the only book of the Bible that we're going to be in today, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to go ahead and give you guys a little bit of a context. We can go ahead and put that down just for a minute. A uh, little bit of context to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he's writing to believers, he's writing to the Corinth church, and in this section of the text, of the letter, he's talking about the tension 
the tension that we feel by living in our temporal bodies, okay? Our bodies are aging, and he says our bodies are likened to that of a tent, and it's just temporal. Who you are is not wrapped up in your body. Who you are is who you're wrapped up in your soul that lives within your body. And so he says there's gonna be, a, there's a tension there. There's a part of you sometimes that wants to go home to be with God, a permanent home, an eternal home. But we're stuck here in our temporal bodies. And so there's a little bit of a tug or war. And so he's talking about the two realms that we're living in. We live in the natural realm and we're confined to this body called the temporal body. Our body continues to age. I'm at the point where it's like, all right, I gotta get wrinkle cream and all that stuff. I haven't done it yet. Um, but I'm at that age, right? The, the, the body continues to decline or you gotta keep pushing yourself in order to push and resist the aging process, but no matter what, the body's still declining. This, this tense temporal. But one day you're gonna leave the body and you're gonna go and face the Lord. And so read with me uh, verse nine. It's not on the screen. I did not give them this verse, but in verse nine, it says this. Uh, so we make it our goal to please him whether we're at home in the body or away from it. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due to him for the things done while in the body, whether good or whether bad, you're gonna give an account to God no matter who you are, no matter what you believe, in the end, there's an accountability that we're gonna have to stand before God. And so we read this text, and how many guys are like, gulp? <laughs> right? All right? Doesn't that put kind of the fear of the Lord in you? He's saying, he's saying, your life on this earth is just temporal. I mean, it's just like, you know, one of those weeds where you blow, and it just disappears? That's how short life is in the scope of all eternity. In this, I know whatever season you're wrestling through, it could feel because of pain and suffering can seem like a really long time. But in the scope of eternity, it's really just just a vapor it's just a breath and so we're going to stand before the lord and he says that should put the fear of the lord in you because you're going to have to give an account for everything that you ever did in your earthly body you feel that feel like oh gosh this is this is not good and so that's why he puts in verse 11 since then we know what it means to fear the lord we try to persuade men and so now paul is saying there's no more need you, you would think that you're gonna say, oh, gulp, I'm gonna stand before the Lord. He's gonna crush me because of all the horrible things I did in the body on earth. All the things, the misappropriation of the tongue, the misappropriation of the eyeballs, the hands. We use our bodies as vehicles a lot of times for doing things that do not please him. And Paul's saying this, if we get to a point where we don't view ourselves from an earthly point of view, but we get to the point where we see ourselves the way God sees us, it changes everything and so now the judgment seat of Christ is not a doom and gloom message. The, the, the judgment seat of a Christ is motivation to help us to persuade men to turn to him so that they themselves can be transformed into the spiritual identity that God defines you to be. It's all about spiritual identity. Your spiritual identity is way more than a ticket to heaven. Your spiritual identity is a total transformation that happens from the inside out. And so that leads us to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 through 21. Paul is making a shift, saying, okay, we're all going to leave our temporal bodies. We're going to stand before the Lord one day. We're going to give an account, but we don't want to be motivated by fear. We want to be motivated with who we are. We need to know who we are in this temporal body. Who you are will live forever. Who you are will live forever. And we need to be in agreement with who God declares us to be. So verse 16 says this, and we can put it on the screen. It says, so now, from now on, we regard nobody from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do, know, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, notice the word in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Verse 18. 
All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. How many guys like that? Standing before God and him not counting your sins against you. Does that make you, give you a little bit more comfort standing before God? You got to know who you are, okay? And so God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, there's that word again, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. These six verses, these small portion of text unfolds four major PowerPoints, new perspectives on our identity. We've covered a lot of different components of our identity, but these, this text unveils four identity points on who we are just in this verse. The first one is this, if you're taking notes. Number one, you are a new creation. You are a new creation. You guys remember the list I put up there, right? I am this, I am this, I am this. If I was to give you uh, uh, all of those components into one major atomic bomb, it would be in this statement. Every single component to your identity Billy, that's a lot of text to remember. How do you remember I'm the righteousness of God? I'm dead to sin and life to God. I'm a doer of God's word. I'm a disciple of Christ. I'm the light of this world. I'm seated with Christ in the heaven. All the I am statements, just memorize this. In Christ, I am a new creation. It's the atomic bomb for everything unfolding at the same time. What does new creation entail? A new, being a new creation, when you say yes to Jesus, it's not a ticket to heaven. It's a transformation into heaven. It's not a ticket into heaven. It's a transformation into heaven. Something in you changes. Being a new creation entails a radical spiritual transformation that takes place on the inside of you. You respond to the gospel of Jesus. He died on the cross for your sin. He rose from the dead. He's knocking at your heart. If you open him up, all your sins will be forgiven. You will become the righteousness of God, but you gotta believe in him. And the moment you say yes to him, you say yes to his righteousness, right? And so we've, we've been doing this glove thing. God is completely clean. He's not tarnished. There's no dark spot in God's character. This is who God is. He's completely holy. He's completely righteous. He's completely merciful. He is judge. He is king. He is healer. He is shepherd. He is savior. Okay, so he's all of these good things. How many of you guys know that God is God? He's holy, right? And so when you say yes to God, this is your life without God. Droopy, flimsy, lifeless, lost in the darkness of sin. This is your life without God. But when you say yes to God, something remarkable happens. Him, his presence, his Holy Spirit, he does something to your spirit. And we call it being born again. He comes and what does he do? He lives within you, right? He lives inside of you. So God is in you if you believe in Jesus. And just like that, your spirit man on the inside becomes born again. We learn that in John chapter three. On the inside, you become a new creation. His spirit brings life to your spirit, and now your spirit, man, is sensitive to his spirit. And so now when you are operating in the workings of your flesh, your carnal self, or your sinful nature, there's a conviction there. Ah, I shouldn't be doing this. Ah, I shouldn't have had to screamed at the kids. I shouldn't have had to yelled at the husband. I should, have dis I should have not dishonored my boss at work. You start feeling this. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is alive in you. You and him are unified. God is in you. And all you still see, and you look at me, you can't literally see God inside of me, Right? But how God sees us is not only are you in Christ as a new creation, you are hidden in him. And so God takes your life and now you are hidden in Christ. And so when God looks at you, he doesn't see the darkened sin that you see. He really sees 
that you are hidden in his son Jesus. And that you are, at this point, justified. You are forgiven. You are cleansed. And this is how you will stand before God on judgment seat. You'll still have to give an account, but here's the good news. He doesn't count it against you anymore because your life is hidden in Christ. And this is how we appear before the judgment seat of God. But if I can just convince you to believe this now, it will change your behavior on earth. So now when you stand before God, you're not terrified of judgment. You're saying, God, I just surrender my life to you. And he says, not only enter in, but he says, now here's your rewards in heaven. How many of you guys know, getting to heaven is a gift. It's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't earn it. But you can earn rewards. You can earn rewards. For every cup of cold water you hand out on a cold day at the firework booth, you get a reward in heaven. According to Jesus, anyone's thirsty and we have cold water there, right? And so it changes our life. But being a new creation also involves not only a spiritual transformation on the inside, it involves a radical life transformation on the outside. Once when you start realizing, I am hidden in Christ, I'm in Christ, right? And Christ is also inside of me. When you start realizing that he's in you, it's only a matter of time before your behavior on the outside begins to mirror with your identity on the inside. Does that make sense? And so notice this phrase, you are a new creation in Christ, but then notice this, the old has gone, the new is here. And so the new man on the inside of you, I know that you struggle with sin. I know that you struggle with beating yourself up. I know that you struggle with saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not a good enough mom. I'm not a good enough husband. I'm not a good enough this or that. I, you struggle with that all the time. But if you can start getting your mind renewed on how he defines you, with your spirit man on the inside, over time, you start this process of putting to death your old nature. Our old nature is corrupted. Our old nature is rebellious. Our old nature is stinky. But as we begin to say, God, no, this is who you define me to be. I'm not gonna believe the lies I hear in my head about what the enemy says because all the enemy wants you to do, the devil, he just wants you to feel like a defeated failure so you never change on the outside because you're still judging yourself on the inside and that you don't feel like you are cleansed. Are you getting something? Okay. And so I remember in high school, I fully surrendered my life to Christ. And I always believed in Jesus, followed him, raised Catholic, I get all that. But in high school, I mean, I fully surrendered my junior year, and I was messed up. But my new nature was wanting to put to death the things of my old nature. And so over time, I began to say, you know what? I want to lead people to the Lord. I want people to understand who Jesus is. I want to see my friends get saved. I want to see people get transformed. But I have a bad problem. Nobody's listening to me because I'm addicted. And what am I addicted to? I'm addicted to cussing in high school. I mean, every word was a bad word. And so over time, I'd be like, God loves you, beep, 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 beep. He wants to save you, beep, beep, beep. I have my Christian pastor friend say, Billy, you're being a bad witness. Like, what are you doing? You're just cussing at people. I'm trying to lead them to the Lord, beep, beep, beep. <laughs> this is me in high school, right? And after a period of time, I said, all right, dude, every time I cuss, pastors, uh, the pastor's son, my, one of my best friends, every time I cuss, I just want you to go to town on me and beat me up. I want you to start punching me. So we're just talking, and I, he starts punching me. And I punch him back. Why'd you punch me? Because you cuss. I didn't beepity cuss. He's all, you're cussing all your, just cuss right. No, I'm not. But over time, what was I doing? I had an accountability partner to beat me into submission. <laughs> but over time, this is what happened. My vocabulary began to match with the beauty of who I was on the inside. And as a result, I got to lead all of my friends to Jesus. And they got to see a radical transformation. All this to say, no matter what you've struggled with, no matter what vices you are dealing with, God, because you are a new creation on the inside, you're gonna spend the rest of your life putting to death those things that have been trigger points for you 
your entire life. And you'll get to the point at the end of your life where you'll begin to look back at what you were in your 20s and you'll go, oh yeah, I see God's faithfulness there, God's faithfulness in my 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. You've never left me. Yeah, why? Because you're a new creation in Christ and he doesn't abandon his children. He's with you every single step of the way. Amen? So number one in this text, you are a new creation. Number two, not only are you a new creation, you are, you are also the righteousness of God. Go and look at with me on the screen, verse 21. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him, notice that, in him, in who? In Christ, inside of Christ, you might become the righteousness of God. In Christ, let me ask you, in Christ, is there any condemnation in Jesus? So if you're in Christ, should you be condemned? No. You become the righteousness of God. Righteousness is not based upon what you do for God. It's what Jesus already did for you on his mission on earth and dying on the cross for your sin. You become the righteousness of God. This is a flooring statement. This is a flooring statement. And if I could encourage you to memorize this, no, in Christ, I am the righteousness of God. If you could just memorize this, it will change and begin to eliminate the doubt, the insecurity, and the failures of your entire life, and now you're gonna start really living for him. What does righteousness of God mean? It simply means, in the most broadest sense, it means being right with God. Righteousness means being absolutely 100% right with God. And how does he make you right with him so that you can stand before him as being righteous? Well, what he does is he does a holy exchange with you. He does a holy exchange with you. In other words, he takes all of your debt of sin, all of your debt with sin, and how many of you guys know sin is heavy? So we do have a problem on earth. It's called sin, and everybody has a sin issue. He takes all of the sin, and he does a holy exchange. All of your sin, boom, 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 and what does he do? He gives you all in exchange. He takes all of your sin. He doesn't count it against. He takes all of your sin. He's taken all of that debt. He pays for it on the cross in full. And what does he give to you? He gives you in exchange of all your debt, he gives in exchange all of his righteousness into your account. Does that make sense? So all of Christ's righteousness belongs into your account. All of it. All of your debt is on Jesus' account, and all of his righteousness has been accredited to your account, so in Christ, you become the righteousness of God. Everybody say, I am, I am. the righteousness of God righteousness in, Christ. in Christ. Say, in Christ, in Christ. I, have I have it all. Outside of Christ, Outside of Christ. I, have of I have none of it. This is who you are in Christ. So not only do you become a new creation on the inside, but you become the righteousness of God and that you pertain and you have all of Christ's righteousness in your account and all of your debt has been paid in Christ's account. This is good news. Yeah. Good news? Yeah. Good news. All right, so not only are you a new creation, not only are you the righteousness of God, but in this text, verse 18, you are also reconciled to God. That's point number three. You are reconciled to God. I am reconciled to God. Everybody say, I am Reconciled to God. Okay, this brings purpose and significance. It actually brings meaning and significance to your whole identity and that you were an enemy of God. You were hostile to him in your mind, the Bible says. But now that you have been reconciled to God, it means that the, the hostility that you had towards God is replaced with peace and harmony. That's what reconciliation is all about. It takes, let me take away all the, the division there and let me reconcile peace in the relationship. And so now your Christianity truly becomes, and you've all heard the famous quote, Christianity's not a religion, it's a... Christianity's not a religion, it's a... It's a relationship with God. The whole reason on why 
you are the righteousness of God, why you're a new creation, why you've been chosen, why you have been cleansed. The whole reason why you have this new identity in God is not just so he can just bless you, although he wants to bless you, and he does bless you, and that's what his word says, and it's his good pleasure to bless you, but it's because he wants relationship with you. He just wants a real relationship with you where you get very honest with God and begin to have, invite him into your situation. Talk to him about your marriage. Talk to him about your kid's life. Talk to him about your retirement. Talk to, invite him into your life and just say, God, I just want your will to be done in my life. I live my life in surrenderance to you. What is it that you want to do through me today, in me today? Speak to my heart, comfort me. He just wants relationship with you. The Bible says this in John 17, 3. Eternal life is for those that know me. It's for those that know him. Do you know him this morning? Do you know him this morning? Like, do you know God this morning? And I would venture to say some of us in our hearts and our minds say, I don't know. We treat our relationship with God sometimes like he's a genie in a bottle. We go to him with all of our wants, and, and the Bible says to do that, but that's, that's like our number one definition of our relationship with God. We actually don't even know how to have a conversation with him. I think in the fall, I'm gonna do a teaching series called Hearing the Voice of God, because I think a lot of us have a one-sided, lopsided relationship with God. We go to God, and we throw up on him, and we walk away, and we go, I don't hear God. How many of you guys know a relationship is a two-way communication streak? Right? When you get married, it's probably because you know them through relationship. Right? How many of you guys know it would be a dysfunctional counseling appointment if only one person in the relationship did all the talking? Uh oh. <laughs> relationship is a two lane road, and it requires both people talking, hearing. The good news is, God's not dysfunctional in the relationship. We're dysfunctional in the relationship. But the good news is, Holy Spirit's the greatest counselor, and, the who's, and where's that counselor live? In us. So there's some free counseling advice for you guys. <laughs> okay, and point number four. So number one, in Christ, you're a new creation. I know what you see yourself. You see yourself in the mirror, and you go, oh, I'm horrible, I'm, I'm not good enough. Uh, if I can only just... Uh, be stronger if I can only get over this thing okay that's you got to just go no God I'm a new creation in Christ I've been spiritually born again on the inside it's no longer I who live but you who lives through me all right and then we got to realize I am the righteousness of God in Christ thank you that my whole life is hidden in you and I thank you that I am reconciled to you I'm okay with you God because of what Jesus did on the cross for me I'm good with you but number four the fourth thing that we learned from this text is that you are an ambassador of Christ. It's our last, uh, our last point today. You are an ambassador of Christ. Notice this. It says, we are therefore, this is who you are. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Therefore, we implore you on Christ's behalf, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors. So, we talked about identity is who you are and purpose is what you do. But when you know that who you are is an ambassador of Christ, it gives purpose to what you do as a realtor. It gives purpose to what you do as an architect. It gives purpose to what you do as a software engineer. It gives purpose to what you do as a farmer. It gives purpose to what you do as a mechanic. It gives purpose to what you do as a teacher. It gives purpose to what you do as a student. It gives purpose to what you do as a son or a daughter. It gives purpose on what you do as as a husband or as a spouse. This is what gives you purpose in your identity. I am the righteousness of God. Okay, did you do anything about it? No, because I didn't have to. I am cleansed of all unrighteousness. Great, what did you do about it? Nothing, he did it all for me. I am forgiven, I am cleansed, I am, I am, I, I am called. Okay, did you do anything about it? No, I didn't do anything about it. He did it all for me. But now it shifts. This is all he wants you to do. This, you want purpose in your life? This is the number one God purpose for everybody in this room. You are an ambassador. 
that gives you purpose. That means you're supposed to do something. That's why the scripture says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So what does ambassador mean? It means three things. Number one, if you're taking notes, an ambassador means that you represent one country to another. As Christians, we represent the kingdom of God on earth. Jesus says, as it is in heaven, let it be on earth. In other words, he can't do that without ambassadors. You represent the kingdom of God. You represent his kingdom, his value system on earth. So that's what an ambassador does. Number two, an ambassador is backed with authority. An ambassador is backed with authority. And so we know that scripture says that Jesus gave us authority to represent him. It's all over the scripture. It's in Luke chapter nine, verse one. We also know that we have authority because we're also considered spiritually in Christ. And where's Jesus? Where's the physical man, Jesus? We know he's not in Maui anymore walking around saying, I'm Christ. I mean, you know, they go, the weird guys that hold up signs and say, I'm Jesus. He's not here on earth. Where's Jesus? Is, is Jesus in heaven? Do we all agree Jesus is in heaven? Yeah, we, we, okay, so Jesus is in heaven. Well, spiritually, you're in Christ, in heaven. And the Bible says that your citizenship is in heaven. And so just because of our own citizenship in heaven, we have authority here on earth to represent him. And so, and then number three, what else does an ambassador do? An ambassador has a specific message, which is to communicate the message and values of the country or entity that it represents. And as believers in Christ, our purpose and our mission is to represent God on earth. We are his ambassadors. And according to God, God is imploring us to do one thing really, really well. One thing really, really well. Notice in verse 18 through 20 on the scripture. It says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. He gave us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to who? Who? The message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. In these three verses, just 18, 19, and verse 20, notice five times, this is a big deal to God, five times he mentions the word reconciled, be reconciled, ministers of reconciliation. Five times he mentions it in these three verses. Reconciling people to God as Christians is our number one purpose as ambassadors of God. And he says, as an ambassador of mine, you are a minister of reconciliation. Wait, I'm a minister? No, 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 Pastor Billy, you're a minister. Um, the people behind the pulpit, they are ministers. I don't have my license to minister. I'm not ordained. No, no, no. According to God, you're a minister. And you're a minister of one thing. You're a minister of reconciliation. And you have the message of reconciliation. And we're to implore people at work, our family members, the people who disrespect us, the people who don't honor us, we're to implore people from all over to be reconciled back to God relationship. It's your number one assignment for the purpose of your life as you live in this temporal tent before God calls you back home. He says, son, daughter, I changed your identity. I transformed you on the inside. Did you allow that to get into your heart and mind to persuade you to go out and represent me as an ambassador on earth as it is in heaven? Did you do it? I'm giving you a whole lifetime to learn how to do it. I'm giving you a whole lifetime to know that I'm with you, I'm in you, I'm for you, I'm above you, I'm behind you, I'm faithful to you, but I'm giving you this purpose in this life. Listen, we live in a culture that's very divided. Very divided. And God's saying this, God would be saying this, do you realize how many people in this world are divided against me? Do you realize how many people in this world are truly divided against me? That many people in this world are gonna go to hell, and I don't want that. But I need representatives on me on this earth. It's not good enough behind pulpit preaching every Sunday. 
The people of God in the churches need to be activated in the school systems, in the work systems, in, in higher realms of government, in the educational systems. We need Christians everywhere to know who they are, that I'm an ambassador of God. My Christianity is just not all about me and God, although we treasure that. It's really about the purpose that we have in God, which is representing him on this earth. This is why Jesus told his disciples, man, the harvest is ready, but man, there's nobody out here working it. Why? Because we get so consumed on the inside with just me and God, me and God, me and God, me and God, and then we forget that people all around us are suffering and are about ready to go to hell. And God's saying, I want to use you, but you got to know your identity. And so I believe there's two reasons why people are not functioning as ambassadors of Christ. Number one, it's because they don't really, they have not fully embraced, maybe they've never been taught this. And most of us probably have never been taught this. They really don't know their true identity as being an ambassador of Christ. They don't know who they are. They don't know that they're the righteousness of God. They don't know that they're cleansed. They don't know that they're called by God. They still think that they're sinners before God, that they're unworthy before God, that they're inferior. They still believe that they are wrapped up in the darkness of sin and that they're a slave to bondage. They still think that way. And if you think like that, you'll be terrorized with fear. You will never share the gospel because it's just too terrifying in our culture. We're sheep among wolves. I know. And so I believe a lot of people just don't know who they are. And then number two, I also believe it's because people don't know how to share the message of reconciliation. So I'm going to share with you how to share the message of reconciliation and we'll bring closure. Is that cool? Yeah. You guys good? Yeah. All right. Notice on the screen here. Message of reconciliation. Number one, what you need to know is that it all starts with God. It doesn't start with us. Thank God. How many of you guys know the pressure's not on us? It's all on God. Notice this. It all starts from God. It says all of this is from who? who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that who? That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. So is it all you reconciling the world to Christ? Or is it all on God? It's all on God. Okay, number two. Message of reconciliation is that reconciliation happens through his son. Notice here on the, ver uh, the verse, verse 18, it says this, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through who? Christ. Is it through you? No, it's through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in? Christ. All right, so Christ is the means of reconciliation. God is the reconciler. This is why God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus to reconcile the world back to himself. Number three, how does Jesus reconcile, or how does God reconcile people back to Christ? It's, it, the answer is right here in verse 21. How did Jesus do it? Here we go, verse 21. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Nope, uh, point number three. That's point number four, sorry. Through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself. Here we go. Not counting, not counting the sins against us. God made him, verse 21 says, God made him, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. That is how we are reconciled to God. Through Christ, in which God made Christ who had no sin to be sin for us. And what's the benefits of reconciliation. The benefits of reconciliation is twofold. Number one, as a result, he does not count people's sins against them any longer. You count it against yourself, and I'm not saying there's not consequences for sin, but he doesn't count it against you any longer. And then number two, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. This is the benefits of saying yes to Jesus. You become right with God and all of his righteousness goes to your account, he becomes sin for you in order to not count your sin against you anymore. This is the message of reconciliation. A lot of people have a hard time describing it. We get scared about how do I share it with my family members. Listen, I've taught hundreds, probably if not thousands of people how to share the message of reconciliation. 
What is the message of reconciliation? One of the benefits of being at the firework booth is this last week I got to minister to quite a number of people, and one of them was a member in our church. And then, uh, he was just wanting to know, how do I share the gospel? What's this message of reconciliation? I said, you can do it. It's very simple. It's this. God loves you because God's the one who's wanting to reconcile you back to himself. So he sent his son, Jesus. Jesus is the means of reconciliation. Jesus, he who knew no sin, became sin for you. He took all of your sin and he nailed it on a cross. On the third day, he rose again. If you open up your heart and allow him to come in, then guess what? He will never count your sins against you. You will become the righteousness of God. You will become cleansed of all ungodliness in your life. You will be called. You will be chosen. You're a son, a daughter, lavish with love. You become a child of God. And so my question to you is this. If you can have all your sin forgiven, have eternal life, become a child of God, become the righteousness of God, get your name written in heaven, is that something that you would want? Is that something you would want? And so let's all stand.